This has only been invented uh, three years ago. It's called a uh, word to vec and there have been some variants since then. And this technique has actually become the, the most fundamental way to use any machine learning on text. It might be that the most crucial step for human learning and machine learning is actually the very same step, namely learning to read. We want our computers to be able to extract information from text. Whenever you want to use text for a machine learning system, you need to represent the input data. So it needs to be translated into a numerical representation. Now, there is a naive way to do so. The naive way is called one-heart. One-heart representations of words consist in representing a word like cat as a huge column with all zeros entries, except for the one entry that corresponds to the word cat. However, using the one-heart representation means that we are going to have to use huge columns of vectors to represent each word in English, and this poses at least three problems. First, this is very cumbersome for computers. They would have to deal with these huge columns of numbers just to understand one single word, and this would lead to huge computation times. Second, we are likely to run into overfitting. This means that our machine learning algorithms are likely to focus on these random fluctuations that looks like a pattern, but that isn't really a pattern. And this is very bad because then predictions that will be made based on this machine learning algorithm will be based on this noise and not on the real underlying pattern. Third and finally, the one heart representation does not reveal the similarity between certain words. For instance, we want our word representation to sort of reveal the fact that the word cat is very similar to the word cat. For the last two decades or so, there has been a lot of effort in searching for concise and relevant numerical representations of words. And in 2013, a group of researchers at Google has found a clever way to do so, which is based on neural network training. This word representation is called word to vec However, like a lot of neural network algorithms, word to vec was a bit miraculous and strange somehow. It did work, but it wasn't clear why. It turns out that there is a wonderfully nice way to interpret word to vec as an implicit matrix factorization. Let's get back to the explanations of Professor Martin Jaggi of the IC school at EPFL. Here we have actually a very nice unsupervised method. So we don't even know, need to know labels. We can just use a very big bunch of text, many, many documents. Let's take the entire Wikipedia and then you can use it to, to find such numbers for each word. So we take all the text we have and we build uh, a very big matrix. A matrix, by the way, is just a table of numbers. The matrix contains all the words, so it's maybe one million by one million, if there are a million words. And in every position of this, this table, we write how many times did these two words appear together. So here is the, the row of this table which corresponds to, to the word cat, and here is another word. So, and I can look at the column of my table for the other word. So here's the dog. And then I look at this position and I see in Wikipedia these two words have appeared together three times. Intuitively, the entry in the ith row and the jth column will tell us how related the ith word and the jth word are. Typically, you can expect cats and dogs to often appear in the same Wikipedia articles. However, I'm going to bet that eigenvectors and triceratops don't. I might be wrong. So actually, most of the words they never appear together. Words are sometimes very rare and if they're from a very different context, then they do not appear together. So most of these entries in the table in the matrix, they're actually zeros. So given this table, we can use it to find such vectors for each word. And how do we do that? Well, the key here is to introduce an inner product between different words. Intuitively, if words were arrows in 3D space, then this inner product would be a way to measure how similar 
the two words are. When two arrows are the same, the inner product will be huge, but when the arrows are orthogonal and point to very different directions, then their inner product is zero. So that's, let's call this the vector u, and this is the vector v. And the inner product of these two vectors is defined like this. You write it like this, maybe. It's very simple. It's just the first two entries will be multiplied, and then you add up the second entries multiplied, and then the third entry. So that's the inner product of two vectors. And what I find pretty amazing is that this algebraic computation is actually equivalent to the geometrical interpretation that I gave earlier. In any case, importantly, this inner product between the vector representing the word cat and the vector representing the word dog needs to agree with the matrix we were given. Here is a tree for this word. So what we want is that this inner product between the vector of the two words is actually roughly 3. Actually, we're going to want a slightly different value from 3, but never mind about that for now. So can we find uh, vectors u's and v's, actually a vector for every word, such that all the words, if you combine two of them, uh, roughly give the right count. So, And that's how we, we actually find word representations. In the end, we write all the word vectors into a table which has three columns. Here we have the vector for cat is in this row, and here we have the three numbers for, for the other word. So this is a big matrix, a big table. If we multiply it with itself, but flipped around, so this is the transpose of a matrix, then we want this to be roughly our, our big table over there. So we started with a symmetric square matrix that counts the similarities between words. What Juvek aims at factorizing this big matrix as a product of a tall and skinny matrix multiplied by its transposed. Here we're talking about matrix multiplication, which is a very particular kind of multiplication which I won't detail here. Now, for those of you who know principal component analysis or PCA, this looks a lot like PCA and previous research had suggested using PCA to compute word vectors. However, word to vec actually differs from PCA in the intuitive sense that it gives more importance to large entries of the matrix. So it's kind of okay if we don't get the small entries of the matrix right. For more details, please refer to the papers I put in the description. So if you can find these two small matrices, such as they approximate the big matrix, then you have found good uh, word representations. And these representations are actually at the moment used for all machine learning applications with text. It's very nice because you don't need to know anything about your text. This is unsupervised. You can just run it and find representations. And then when you have text, you just use these three numbers for, for each word which you have uh, constructed. In reality, you don't do this for, for just three dimensions, but you actually use 50 or 100. And this can be very useful if you want to pre-process raw data before giving it to some other machine learning algorithm. For example, if you are given a text, you want to use machine learning later on to say if this text is a positive or a negative emotion, for example. Another thing you can do is to play with the meaning of words. To most AI researchers' surprise, when you apply the operation king minus man plus woman to the vectors representing the words king, man, and woman, you obtain the vector that corresponds to the word, wait for it, queen. How awesome is that? There are many other things you can do with text. You can ask if this text is uh, relevant for this particular topic or not. There are many things you can use machine learning on text. But to do that, you need to, to transform your input data into numbers. And that you then feed into the machine learning uh, system, for example, a classifier or a neural network and then you can use it to, uh, to get a nice application. Now, let's get back to the detail we skipped earlier. The two vectors, when you uh, take their inner product, they should roughly be this count, so five. Well, what people do in reality is actually they use uh, approximately the logarithm of the count instead. So that's a function which grows much slower than 
than the input. So you can imagine there are many words which are incredibly common in language, like the word the, so that appears in every sentence. We don't want to overcount that word too much. So, so that's why it's a good reason to, for this f function, which takes this count which you have observed, you take something like the logarithm, and then you try to find uh, the two matrices for the, for the word representations. Now the major variant of what Martin Jaggi presented here is uh, the analysis of the so-called word context matrix. For the word context matrix, the rows still represent words, however now the columns represent some context in which the words are found. Again, what we can do is to try to write each entry of the matrix as the result of an inner product between the word that corresponds to the row and the context that corresponds to the column. This mathematical model is the same model as people use for recommendo systems. So there you have people giving ratings to movies and users. So here we would say that uh, this person has rated the movie to the column with three stars. And people use exactly the same mathematical model to find uh, good recommendations for movies or products, like say on Amazon, than the model we've described here. So then every recommendation will be the vector of the user multiplied with the vector of the product, and this is going to tell you how recommended this particular product is for that user. More generally, SVD has great applications in recommending systems, which are at the core of many, many business like Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, and even Facebook, Twitter, and Google. We're not going to take the decision away from the doctor, but try to support them to, to show them, hey, this might be a connection which, which could be relevant for, for this particular uh, patient.